<laughs> oh, I'm glad to be here with you guys again today. And I hope you're glad to be here also. And for those of you joining us on Zoom or YouTube later, thank you so much for, for being a part of us today and joining together. It's been great. I hope you guys had a great Labor Day week. And, uh, you know, preachers, it throws us off because I still have a, I still have exactly the same amount of work to do, but just one less day to do it in. So, but it's been good. I'm glad to see you all here. Um, this is going to be a little bit different kind of message today. Um, it's going to be one point. Now, I know I don't want to mislead you. It doesn't mean it's only going to be one third as long, but it is just going to be one point. And this is it right here. Be persistent. That's what I want you to get out of today. So be persistent. So it's a little bit different style here today. So uh, bear with me. I've, I've never experimented with the style before. But uh, so we'll go a little bit differently. But before we get to the scripture today, oh, I'll tell you how we're going to do it. We're going to actually take a little bit longer time of exposition. We're going to cover a little bit more passage today. And so I'll do some scripture and some commentary, and then we'll get some application point at the very end. But I mentioned last week about the Chronicles of Narnia, and I was surprised to find out that many of you have not read that book. So let me try this. Let's go to, to movies. Then. Do, did any of you see the movie that won the best picture in 1981? Anybody know what that is? But, all right. Yeah, me neither. I don't really I have to look it up again. But it was Chariots of Fire. How many of you saw Chariots of Fire? Okay. Wow, not everybody's seen Chariots of Fire. Well, let me give you a little background on it real quick because it's going to give us the best opening illustration for the day. Chariots of Fire is about a Scottish missionary named Eric Little. Uh, or Liddell, little, little, I think is how he pronounces it, but it might, might be Liddell. I apologize. If your family, if the family uh, is watching, I'm so sorry for mispronouncing the name there. But Eric Liddell was born in China in 1902, of Scottish missionaries. And so he, they, were, they were there with the London Missionary Society, born in 1902. He came back to England, to the Great Britain, to, to be educated. And when he was in school in Edinburgh, he qualified to run the 100 meter race for Great Britain in the 1924 Olympics in Paris. Now, he was famous for several reasons. First, he was the only Scottish, he was the first Scottish citizen to win a gold medal. So it was a big deal. He was known as the Flying Scotsman. That was his nickname back then. But what made him most famous in those Olympics was, and this is the heart of the story of, of the Chariots of Fire is as he was getting ready, as they were going over to, to France for the Olympics, he'd already qualified for another meter race, there was a qualifying heat, if you've seen the Olympics, you know, they have, a lot of times have heats that you have to go through, and he discovered that the qualifying heat that he had to participate in to run the 100 meter would be run on Sunday, and he was a very strict Sabbath keeper, and he refused to run on Sunday, even though the Prince of Wales personally encouraged him to run in the race, he said his, you know, was that, uh, that he was going to keep the Sabbath and he wouldn't run. And so he bowed out of the race. Well, that would have knocked him out of the Olympics, but one of his um, teammates had already won a silver medal and offered to let Eric take his place in the 400 meter race. Now, if any of you are runners, you know the 100 meter and the 400 meter are run very differently. Um, he had run hundreds before, but he had not trained for it at this time. And he went on and won the gold medal in the 400 meter race for. For Great Britain in the, in the 1924 Olympics. Um, and then after that, he, um, he finished his studies and went back to, to China as a missionary and actually died there in an internment camp just months before World War II ended. And so uh, he was very, very famous. It said when he passed away, all stopped him. But there's a clip in the movie that you haven't seen that's really, let me set it up for you, that before the Olympics, a few uh, months before that, there was a, a, a race between um, Scottish and French runners, just a, a regular heat they were having, you know, running this. And so it's a 400 meter race, and Eric got knocked down in the race. So here's the clip from the movie to let you see what Eric did at that point. It's a great movie, it's a little bit slow, but you ought to, you ought to watch it if you haven't. But Eric, after being 60 feet behind all the running packs, Jump back up, and he actually won the 400 meter race. And that's what we can learn from the apostles today. Don't give up, be persistent. So let's go back to, to Acts. We're going to go back in the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter five today. But let's recap on what we've looked at so far. So 
uh, if you think of this as a serial previously on Acts of the Apostles, here's what we, what we don't know. Jesus gives him a commission to go to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. So that's that outline of the book of Acts. And they're still in Jerusalem at this point. So Jesus gives him this commission. Then Jesus ascends into heaven. And then the Holy Spirit comes. 3,000 people are saved. And then in Acts chapter 4, the lame man is healed. And we find the first persecution by the Sanhedrin coming at that point. And we see the apostles, as we saw last week, had a bold response to that persecution. Now that brings us up, that's a real quick bring us up through the end of Acts chapter 4. So we're going to start in chapter 5 here. We're going to skip part of chapter 5. We're going to start about verse uh, 18 or so, I think. Is that where we're starting? Yeah, verse yeah, verse 17. So we start at verse 17, but up to 16, here's what's going on so far. All right, we're going to see first there's a there's an example of great generosity in the church. That at the end of chapter four, people begin selling their property and possessions and we're sharing it with, with anyone. The part the start of chapter five talks about Ananias and Sapphira. And uh, if I were going to preach on giving, this would be a great chapter to give on because what happens is Ananias and Sapphira sell a piece of property. And they take part of the money and give it to the church. But they told them that was the whole amount. It would be like selling your selling your home now for $1.8 million or whatever it is, and taking $0.9 million, $900,000, give it to the church, say that's what we sold it for. And what happened is when they did that, said that was the whole money, Ananias actually passed away right there in front of the church when he was given because Peter said he lied to us about it. He said, the property was yours to keep and do as you wanted to with it. And even when you sold it, you could do whatever you wanted to with the money to give it or give part of it or give none of it. But you lie to the church about it, and God's going to punish you for that and dies right there. A little bit later, his wife comes in and says, and he says, How much did you sell the property for? And she told him, and he said, You know, you and your husband conspired to lie. I got bad news for you. The people who buried your husband are coming in right now, and she sees them and she passes them. Now, of course, what happens here is it's scary to everybody. Everybody begins to realize this is much more serious. So there's this, there's this great generosity, but then we realize there's a great, great seriousness about this whole thing. There's a great responsibility. There's a great, uh, a, a great sense of awe and power that comes on everybody. And so it really becomes um, difficult, but they show great discipline at the same time because they continue to, to meet regularly at Solomon's portico. That was that a big covered area in one of the temple courtyards where they could all get together and begin to do that. And they realized people began to respect them and take them very, very seriously. So now we're going to get to chapter, uh, chapter 5, starting with verse 17. And um, uh, before we do, let's have a word of prayer. Father, and again, thank you for the opportunity to come before you and to worship you today. Father, we acknowledge your presence here. And Father, as we look into these words that Luke has written, we know they were written by your inspiration and written for our instruction as well as the instruction of those who have come before us. And so, Father, today as we continue in worship, may your spirit speak to us and for each one of us here, teach us out of this word what we need to know to be able to be the church you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's go look at verse 18. I'm going to keep the scripture up here as much as we can, but if you've got your Bibles, we want to open to it because we're going to refer back to several things here. So starting with verse uh, 17, actually, it says, but the, uh, but the high priest stood up along with his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were all filled with jealousy and laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison and leading them out, he said, Go stand and speak to the people in this temple in this temple area the whole message of this life. Upon hearing this, they entered the temple into the temple area about daybreak and began to teach. Now, a lot has happened in these sort of sort of verses right here. So let's kind of look at it again. Now it sounds a bit like what we talked about last week, doesn't it? They're preaching in the temple, they get arrested. And some scholars have thought maybe this is the same story just being told from a different aspect, but there's a lot of differences. In the last chapter, it was just Peter and John. This chapter, it's Peter and, probably, and John and probably all the apostles. 
doesn't say exact name, it just says the apostles. And they arrest them there. And this time they put them in a public prison. What that means is not a prison owned by the public, like because all prisons are owned by the public. I guess we have some private prisons nowadays, but they're still administered by the public. What it means is it was a prison where everybody could see them. It was publicly visible. It was a, an attempt to, uh, to uh, shame the apostles and really let people know, no, these are guys aren't preaching the way of life. They're criminals. We're putting them in the prison here. But it was interesting that they were trying to make a statement about the apostles being um, prisoners. But instead, God used it as a great example of everybody knew they were in prison. But in, in, even though it was a public prison, they were able to escape by the work of an angel of the Lord. Now, angel of the Lord could be a couple of things. The word angel, you may know this in this message. So uh, actually, if uh, if you tell one of your, if you, you know, when your kids were little, if you told one of your kids to go get their brother or sister for dinner, in Greek, they would have been your angel, that they were your messenger to go tell, tell the message. And so some of the things might have been a person, maybe it was. I don't think so. I think it was probably a spiritual being that did this because it says the guards are still there and they got let out. And so everybody knew they were in prison. The next day they were out. And people would get to think, wow, some of their kind of miracles happening. It's really going well for these guys. It made them famous. And this messenger urged them to go back into the temple courtyard and keep preaching the message of Jesus. And so at daybreak, they're right back in the temple, preaching the word, just as everybody is showing up. They're ready with the word. Now, continuing on, let's look now at verse 22. Now, when the high priest... And his associates came, they called the council together. And this council is the Sanhedrin, the 70 elders, mostly Sadducees, we talked about them last week, but some Pharisees and some just elders and highly respected people. So the council, that is all the Senate of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison for them to be brought. But the officers who came did not find them in prison, and they returned and reported, saying, We found the prison locked quite securely, the guards and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one in sun. Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. But someone came and reported to them, the men whom you put into prison are standing in the temple area and teaching the people. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. Now, this is, I think, one of the great examples of Luke's humor again. We talked about that a lot of times. Can you imagine? This almost sounds like a sitcom. So the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin all get together, and they're assembled in their council room, which, by the way, was probably near the temple. Might have been even in the temple confines there. We don't know exactly where it was, but it was certainly near the temple. And they're getting ready to pass judgment on these guys. So they send for them to go, to go find them. The guys come back going, um, you know, the guys you put in prison, um, we lost them. The guards are still there. And so the Sanhedrin are sitting there going, it says they were perplexed. They were just sitting there going, okay, what's going on here? And they were beginning to think this movement may be bigger than they thought. The first thing they probably thought, because remember, the Sanhedrin did not believe in angels or demons. So the first thing they're thinking is, we've got a spy in our midst. They've got, they've got confederates here among us. Oh no, what are we going to do? And they will begin to think, maybe this movement is bigger than we think. Sadly, they had no idea how big the power of this movement was at this point. But they're just sitting there confused, and Luke's going, hey, you guys just don't get it at all. And so while they're sitting there trying to figure it out, another guy comes in going, hey, those guys you put in prison, we found them! They're back doing exactly what you told them not to do. Got to be so confusing to them. And so then they send the temple guard out, but very nicely. And I imagine the temple guards going out there going, um, guys, um, we did you mind coming back to the talk to the council? We'd sort of like to maybe continue this conversation. If you don't mind, we'd be okay. Why? Because they were afraid that they would be stoned. That shows you how great the crowd was for them at that point. That they were defending it. And going, this is, we want to hear this. This is great stuff. It's interesting. They were afraid of being stoned. 
even though later they were going to think about stoning the apostles themselves. But they had to be nice because they were afraid the crowd would turn on them. So Luke is really showing how big this movement is and how little power the Sanhedrin actually had. Now let's continue on to verse 27. And when they had brought them, they had them stand before the council because that was typically the way it happened. The council was seated, but the, the people, they well, usually, usually like a semicircle, and the people stood there in the middle of them, defending themselves. And the high priest interrogated them. And he said, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching this thing. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. And we'll talk more about that in a future sermon. But Peter goes on to say, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one God who God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, which you guys don't believe in, whom God has given to those who obey him. So the trial starts back up and the Sanhedrin bring them in and they make two charges against these guys. They say the first charge is you're doing what we told you not to do. You're preaching and we've specifically told you not to do this. And to this, Peter's reply is um, yeah, we're not going to stop doing that. Sorry. It just isn't going to happen. we got to obey God rather than obeying you guys. That was his answer to the first charge. Sanhedrin said not to preach, but God said otherwise, and God wins. Their second charge was, not only are you preaching what we told you not to, but you're also trying to blame us for Jesus' death. Now, we talked about last week that we're all responsible for Jesus' death. Okay? I am I, firmly believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for my sins and for yours. My sins are part of the reason why Jesus is on the cross. And my sins were what part of what was forgiven on the cross. So I bear that blame. Jesus died for me. He died for you and for you and for you. But we do have to admit, though, that the Sanhedrin had a special sort of responsibility in this. And Peter was just telling it like it is. They had a special responsibility. To kind of show you what it means, let's look at the book of John, chapter 18. I've got that up on the screen for you here. Pilate said to them, to the Sanhedrin, take Jesus, take him yourselves, and judge him according to your law. And the Jews said, that was the Sanhedrin at that point, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. So specifically, the Sanhedrin was saying, you know, Pilate said, you can just flog him, you can just have him punished. You got, and they said, no, because under Roman law, we're allowed to punish people, but we can't put the death penalty. So we're handing him over to you because we want you to put him to death. It was their specific request that Jesus died, so they did have a responsibility for that. The next chapter over in John 19, uh, the end of verse 11, Jesus is talking to Pilate, and uh, he says to Pilate, the one who hated you, hated me over you, has the greater sin. Even Jesus said, Pilate, you're guilty in this. This is part of your responsibility. But I'll be honest, you're just a part of what God's playing here. The greater sin belongs to the ones who handed me over to you. So Peter and John heard Jesus say that. So they were just telling it like it is when they said, that the temple guards and the Sanhedrin had a special responsibility in this because they wanted Jesus to be put to death. So Peter responds to, to make matters worse. He basically responds to him, yes, you put him to death. But God decided to exalt him and through him to provide forgiveness to everyone. And it was available to the Sanhedrin also. And he made it clear the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to this. So again, they were standing there, two, two charges. One, don't preach. We told you not to do that. They said, we're not going to stop. Second, you're blaming us for his death. And Peter said, you are to blame for his death. But he also offered him forgiveness. And what was their response? Let me go to verse 33. But when they heard this, they became infuriated and nearly decided to execute them. 
Now, that's an interesting. Let's stop right there for a second. Think about this. First, that word infuriated. I, I don't like to do this very often because it's you know, because I'm not, I'm not bragging about knowing Greek. It's, I've read commentaries. I studied Greek. I hardly ever use it now. But that phrase infuriated actually is the is the phrase for being cut into or sawn into. It said it was just so tough that they were like just split apart by it. That they were just cut to the quick. They were so angry over it that it's like they had just fallen apart. And it's a great image for that, right? them being infuriated and nearly decided to execute. I think for a moment, though, we've already learned they weren't allowed to execute anybody. That wasn't provided that they were going to do it anyway. The Roman law said, you can't execute somebody. He said, forget the Romans. We're going to break this law. We're going to kill these guys right now, which would have been by stoning, which is what the temple guard was afraid of when they went to the temple to get the guys. Second, neither one of these things are things that were capital offenses. Disobeying the order of the Sanhedrin would not be punishable by death. It would be punishable by a fine or by imprisonment or by flogging, but not death. And blaming the Sanhedrin for Jesus' death, that would, that's not a capital offense in any way, shape, or form. Yet they were still going to kill them for this. But here's where God intervenes. A Pharisee named Gamaliel, teacher of the law, respected by all people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put them in outside for a short time. Now, this guy, Gamaliel, Gamaliel you've probably heard of him before. <clears throat> He's most notable because in Acts chapter 22, Paul says he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a, was a rabbinic teacher. In fact, he found he was a, the head of a school called the School of Hillel, which is it's some confusion about whether Hillel was his father or grandfather. Most people think it was his grandfather. And Gamaliel inherited that uh, position of being the main teacher of the rabbinic school of Hillel, which was known as the more liberal one, and not liberal like we think of today, but it was the one that had a more fluid interpretation of, of the law at that point. So it was a little bit less conservative than maybe some of the other Pharisees, but not so liberal as the Sadducees were. So he was sort of a middle of the road kind of guy. And well respected. In fact, uh, he's mentioned a lot of times in Jewish literature outside the Bible. It actually says when when uh, Gamaliel died, that like the, the teaching of the law died with him. So it was kind of a phrase that he used there. He was that well respected. He was, I guess, he would be like the Billy Graham of, of his day. All right, that people just respected everything that he said. So anyway, he's getting up there to talk with him, and he tells a story about two guys who had previously started insurrections. This is back in uh, uh, verse 35. So the man, and he said to them, men of Israel, be careful as to what you're about to do with these men. For some time ago, Thutis appeared, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined him, and he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. Now, this guy, Thutis, there is a reference in Josephus of a man named Thutis, but he did his resurrection about 10 years after, in insurrection about 10 years after this time. So most scholars believe there was another one that we don't really know about that maybe before Jesus was born in, that, that people knew about because Gamaliel would have been a little bit older and able to do that. But So they all knew, all of the running the scene, he knew what he was talking about. So he talks about this one, and then continuing on in verse 37, he says, after this man, Judas of Galilee appeared in the days of the census and drew away the people after him, and he also perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. Now, this is what we do know about. This was actually in 9 AD. When he says that in the time of the census, we usually think of the census of Jesus, it, uh, but it was after that time. So this guy, uh, Judas, did rise up, and the Romans put that, put, put that insurrection down. But, so they knew what was talking about with that. But it's interesting, even though Gamaliel says it came to nothing, Actually, that's where the, the group called the Zealots came from. Simon, not Simon Peter, but the other Simon who was a part of Jesus' uh, followers, Simon the Zealot, actually had been a part of this group, and Jesus saved him out of that group. So there was, it wasn't really coming to nothing. Just showing that Gamaliel's advice wasn't necessarily advice from God. It was human advice, but God used it to, to, to save the apostles at this point. So anyway, coming back to that, so this man, they were all scattered. Continuing in verse 38. 
And so in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men. Leave them alone. For if the source of this plan or movement is men, it will be overthrown. But if the source is God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. Now, again, I want to say that's 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 human reasoning there that God used. We, we might not necessarily be able to say that maybe the policy would be good all the time. For example, there are a few Christian cults out there that have been around for 100 years or more. And we can say, well, they're going to die. Well, maybe they, they will die out at some point. You know, but you can't say, oh, you know, because they've existed for this long, that means they, they're doing the right thing. But it does also say that if we're focused on God and we're focused on what, what he wants, he'll direct us toward the truth. And those things will eventually die out. Some it may be until the second coming of Jesus. Some it might be before then. But, um, but one thing we can't say, Christianity has existed throughout all that time. There's nobody around today that worships Zeus, is there? I don't think so. There's nobody around today that worships Baal, like they did in the Old Testament, or Molech, or Chemosh, Chemosh, or some of those ancient um, gods. Nobody that, that, that worships the Egyptian gods anymore. But God's will and God's word will prevail throughout all of this. We can keep that as a promise that that is part of the truth of what Gamaliel was saying right here. So the bottom line is God used some Gamaliel's words to, to convince the Sanhedrin not to kill the apostles. There was not time for that yet. So let's go on to verse 40, and then this will bring us to the end of the chapter here, and we'll get to our point here. So they followed his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and released him. And uh, speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not stop teaching and preaching the good news of Jesus as the Christ. This is where we get to really our point for today is that even though you say God saved them from this, they still wind up getting the punishment. They got flogged. And we don't know exactly what kind of punishment the flogging was, but most likely the most common flogging at that point, and what was most common in Jewish life, as well as what was most allowed by the Roman government, was 39 lashes. Because in the Old Testament, 40 lashes was supposed to be the most, and they, 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 they put it down to 39 just in case they discount. You hear Paul talk about a couple of times receiving 40 lashes minus one several times. And what they do, of course, is they, they take their shirts off and they have them kneel over and they give them those 39 lashes. It's actually 26 across the back and 13 across the chest. And basically, they were probably bloody all over. Not only gross shower, but just you can imagine, you've seen pictures of it. And these guys, how furious are these guys? So furious that they were torn in two of them and then wanted to kill them. So I can imagine who were doing the vlogging was thinking, I'm going to give them 39 lashes. And if they die, they die. You know, we just know we just we didn't kill them, we just gave them vlogging. But here's the point of all of this that it says, and this is the, uh, the really most important verse for us after this time, and it's in verse 41. So they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer for his shame. And I love the juxtaposition of the words there, that they were worthy of the shame. I used to think of those words as opposites. But they said, the shame of flogging shows us that we're worthy in God's eyes. They were happy. And I imagine, what does the Sanhedrin do at this point? You give people the biggest punishment that you're allowed to give them, and they go like, this is great, thank you. We're, 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 they, were, they were ecstatic and excited and rejoiced over it. That is the kind of persistence we're talking about. We look at this passage, we see that the early church faced several setbacks. In chapter 4, Peter and John were arrested. Well, first, their leader, Jesus, had been killed, came back to life. 
You know, we know that. So that was that was good. But then Peter and John are arrested and warned. Then they're arrested again. Oh, but between those times, God had sent them a great reminder that this is serious. Don't come to church and just play about it because they could see the graves of Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira right out where they had been buried. That this is not a thing to play at. We're serious about you. Now, I don't think God's going to kill any of us. I don't think he, God did some special things in Acts that he doesn't do necessarily today, at least as often, but he still can if he wants to. But that was a ser- that could have been a serious setback for them. I mean, how many of you would want to join a group that was known for having people die because they were part of it? Probably not very many of us. Then they had the setback of being, like I said, being arrested again and being put in jail. And then they had the ultimate one of, at least to this point, of receiving the 39 lashes. <laughs> Yet when they were given those 39 lashes and told never to speak in the name of Jesus again, they said, it's not going to happen. We're going to keep doing it. In fact, we're even more determined now. We're even happier about doing it. We feel like now God has given us a sign by this flogging that we're doing the right thing, that God is happy with us. And they kept meeting at Solomon's portico and kept talking about Jesus and kept going. One point out of this is be persistent. Why do I think it's important for us today? There are a lot of passages. There's so many things I could have gotten out of Acts chapter 5. We're not really necessarily digging in deep into verse by verse. Uh, I think the precept study on Tuesday is doing that. And if you guys want to get that, they probably, I don't, I don't know if there's a limit on how many people can be part of that, but I'm sure that they're, they're nice people. They'd like to jump, jump into that if you really want to dig deeper into it. But why did I choose this? Why do I feel like this is the message for us today? Well, here's what I think is important for us. First, I want you to keep praying for non believing friends and family members. And keep looking for opportunities to share. Persistence. There's an old saying, I think I looked at a lot of sayings about, about persistence here, and there's a lot of great ones. But one I like, and I don't remember exactly who said this, I think it was unknown. It said, difficult things take a long time, impossible things take a little bit longer. But God does impossible things, all things are possible. For him. So if you've got a friend or a family member or a coworker, neighbor that you can pray for for them to be saved. Don't give up on that. Be persistent. Be persistent. Jesus told a couple of parables about that. We're not going to go through today. But I want you to be persistent in praying and looking for opportunities to share. Second, stay dedicated to the mission of our church. As we're moving towards a process of Recovery and health, and by the way, I'm not saying that we're we're totally going to help the church here at this point. There's a lot of good stuff in our church. Okay, so don't hear me saying that. But still, there are things we've got to work through, and it's going to take a while to do it. Um, one of the phrases that counselors use, like in marriage counseling stuff, they say to two couples, "You didn't get into this situation overnight, and you're not going to get out of it overnight." That. In fact, I've heard counselors say basically counseling is usually like one month again for every year that you've been in this, this problem, and sometimes longer than that. It takes a while, it's a process because we're imperfect people and we're going to make some mistakes. We've got some hurts to get over, and it won't happen in a short period of time. Which leads us to the third point don't be discouraged by setbacks, distractions. And missteps. There'll be some. All right. There really will. Um, there's landmines everywhere. I mean, in every part of the area. My, my, my wife and I, my wife and my kids, we got landmines. There's certain things that, that I know I got to be careful with that'll, that'll, that'll push their buttons. And so I, I do need to be careful with that. Um, in a church that's gone through some difficult times, there's landmines out there. And especially when you bring in somebody from the outside like me. It's going to be possible. I'm going to step on some landmines. Now I'm going to try hard not to. I'm talking to people. I'm trying to figure out where lands, landmines are and dig them up and get rid of them. That's great. But um, I'm going to I'm going to make some mistakes. In fact, I've already made a couple of mistakes that I think 
that I that some of you know about, but things like, oh, I probably shouldn't have said that, or, or why I misread that situation. I'm gonna make a few others, okay? Just full disclosure. <clears throat> but when I say that we've got we may have setbacks, distractions, missteps, I'm not being critical, I'm not being judgmental, I'm not complaining. I'm just stating the reality that we're gonna be patient with some setbacks, distractions, and missteps. And it's gonna it, that's okay. We still need to be patient and persistent. And then finally, don't be discouraged or don't let the past control our future. I think that's really important. Sometimes um, they say that if somebody is young, that, that, like if somebody has a trauma when they are 12 years old, for example, and I know some situations like this where this is happening, that there's a part of that person who gets frozen at that age, that there may be, again, I'm just pulling them off the top of my head here, um, somebody who was abused when they were 12 years old. That even when they're 64 like me, that until, unless they've dealt with it and really gone through the process of dealing with it, there's a part of them that stays frozen at 12 years old. They can come out in different ways than different people. And that's that's a that's how we're designed. We have to work to overcome that. And so people can be stuck in their past. We don't as a church don't have to be stuck in our past. Our past does not have to rule our, our present or our future. In fact, one verse I really like is Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Paul says, One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. So, we've made mistakes in the past. As I said, I've made a couple since I've been here. And I've only been here three months. But we can't let mistakes in the past keep us from being bold and persistent in the future. And one last thing, I don't have it on the screen here, but I want to add one last thing to this. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And that leads into the passage where he talks about putting on the full armor of God. And so I want to remind you that our fights, our struggle is not with anybody here in this church. Our struggle is not even with any person out there. If there are people that feel like they're against what we're trying to do at our church, it's not because they're our enemy. It's because they are prisoners of our enemy. Because our struggle is spiritual. The enemy of the apostles wasn't really the Sanhedrin. It was the world forces of this darkness. The Sanhedrin were prisoners Satan. And so the apostles would say, if we're being attacked by Satan, we must be doing the right thing. Whereas the old, the old saying goes, if you're not running into Satan, you're running with him. So, you know, when we start facing struggles, things like that, sometimes it's, it's evidence that we're on the right track. Now, again, like we talked last week, People can be against us because we'll be jerks, too. So don't do that. You, know, you can't be persuasive when you're abrasive, you said. But if we're doing the right thing, we're going to have some setbacks. We're going to have some missteps. We're going to have some opposition. But it's not from people. It's from the world forces of this darkness. And we need to work persistently against them. And so my encouragement to all of us is a firm look at what God has for us in the future. And don't let anything in the past or anything around us deter us from getting up and running the race that before us and completing the race God has given us and winning, not for our good, but for His. Father, I thank you for congregation's patience with me as I try to style you. But Father, no matter my style, your word is still the same. And that's where we want to focus on today. May your spirit teach us, teach us your message out of this passage. Father, help each one of us 
to mount this body, to continue pressing on to the good, to continue to fight the good fight. Father, so many verses that show us that. When we trust in you, you will bring it to us. So, Father, we look to you to give us the strength to keep going, to give us the wisdom to avoid landmines, and to give us the power to make your name known. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.